Great. So we are starting, and I will start in, in Russian and then turn into English mm. translation. Okay. That's Dob great. Добрый вечер. Uh, мы начинаем нашу встречу, философский разговор uh, с замечательным философом, писателем и экологом и художником, кстати, Тимоти Мортоном. Uh, вы его видите, Тимоти. Привет. Наша встреча проходит в рамках выставки очень серьезной такой экологической экспозиции на площадке Севкабеля в Санкт-Петербурге. И посвящена она экологическим проблемам. Всем настоятельно рекомендую обзавестись QR-кодами и продолжать ходить на выставки, особенно на эту. Хочу поблагодарить организаторов. Это, прежде всего, сама команда Севкабеля, а также кураторы Лидия Гуменюк и Ольга Ват, которые рядом с нами. И, конечно же, отдел культуры и образования посольства Великобритании и их программу, благодаря которой мы именно эту дискуссию проводим. Спасибо огромное. У нас будет синхронный перевод, поэтому мы с Тимати общаемся на английском языке, а все, кто подключился, милости просим слушать перевод. Не забывайте, что есть возможность слать вопросы. Мы постараемся с вопросами по возможности работать в реальном времени, но в любом случае оставим время в конце разговора. Так что милости просим активно участвовать в нашем разговоре. Окей, профессор Мортон, my super pleasure uh, to have you at least at least online. And uh, today is Saturday, uh, October 20, uh, October 30th in Russia, and it's the date when lockdown, uh, pandemic lockdown started. So we have more or less the same situation it was in Europe in summer and happening now. And I would like to ask you about uh, pandemic situation in states and how do you have any reflections uh, and uh, feelings about pandemia in terms of your um, philosophical analysis and uh, let's say possible feeling of catastrophe and uh, all emotional loads that uh, we experience now. Yeah, um, well, you know, um, I've been pretending that it's locked down um, for a very long time. Um, the governor of Texas has tried his hardest to um, destroy the lockdown. And he started, you know, maybe in May or June of last year. You have to realize that where I live is basically the South. And the South is the place where they had the slavery the most intense, right? And it's in, you know, Marx calls it primitive accumulation, right? It's like, let's create, a, let's create a huge pile of capital using a whole huge pile of slaves, and then let's automate that shit. Um, and now we live in the automated version. But there is a real plantation mentality down there. Um, a kind of, you know, now it's your breaks over, it's time to get back to work kind of a feeling. Um, and yeah, it's very unpleasant. And mm. so, I've been pretending that that's not happening um, um, with, with, as we, we, with most of my fellow Houstonians. Houston is actually a very progressive town. Um, we voted 98.5% for um, the Democrat in 2016. Um, nobody knows that because the city was redistricted by the Republican. Republican Party and certainly white people. Um, the, the fact that, you know, um, ending white supremacy is, is like key to me logically 
foundational, actually. I don't know whether it comes first or second, but it's logically foundational um, to uh, creating a more ecologically um, just world for, for all life forms, actually. That and me too, you know, so I, I'm pretty sensitive to how, you know, um, trying to end lockdown had a strong dose of, of you know, master versus slave going on. Um, my friend Denise, Denise Ferreira da Silva, she's the author of a book called Towards a Global Idea of Race, and she's a much more articulate philosopher than, than me. Um, and and her, her, her sort of um, thought in that book is that, you know, any master-slave duality, any, sorry, any object-subject duality is a, is a slave-master duality, right? Um, and it's one of the reasons I talk the way I do. Um, of the two things, it's this notion of subject that's the real big problem, I feel, and so does Denise. Um, we just did a thing for the British Library, actually, um, a dialogue a few, a few days ago that was very, very good, and I, and I hope they put it online. Um, it's a great honour to be part of this um, as well. Um, and um, I'm sorry I can't be in St. Petersburg, because I would actually really love that. Um, I've been to Arctic Russia twice, and I've been to Moscow once. To my shame, I should go more. Um, but yeah, the... Um, Lockdown is the wrong word. That's another way of thinking about this, is that actually lockdown really is opening up. You know, physically, in a way, it's locking down because you're not allowed to go to the supermarket without a mask on or whatever. Um, and there was a shelter in place order that, that Mayor Sylvester Turner um, enacted for the city, you know. Um, so in a way, it's like re restricting your behavior. But in another way, it's opening up phenomenologically. It's actually opening up. And opening up again, reopening is locking down. And what are you locking down into? You're locking down into the ceaseless churning of the, of the mechanical version of the automated version of the slavery, um, which is now called neoliberal capitalism, I suppose. Um, and it's, it's sort of very unpleasant to be made to go back to that at full strength, especially now that, you know, it's becoming quite obvious that it's munching the biosphere down to nothing. Um, in May, when lockdown was still a real thing in Houston, um, I heard a sound at five in the morning and I heard this sound, of, you know, waking up, what is this strange sound? It's like the wind, you know, very powerful. I was thinking, gosh, that it's a really strong wind. I don't normally hear that. And then I suddenly realized, oh, it's the sound of cars on the freeway about you know, a quarter of a mile to the south of my house. And I haven't heard that sound um, for a very long time. You know, I mean, I hadn't, I mean, a very long time meaning six weeks, which is a long time in capitalism time. Yeah, where they do nanosecond trading. Um, and so, you know, just the possibility that there could be less churning I don't know if you've ever seen that film Fantasia, the Mickey Mouse, you know, the, he's the sorcerer's apprentice and he um, decides because he's a bit lazy to get the brooms, you know, to cast a spell on the brooms to automate the cleaning. And it's great when there's one broom, yeah, and it's also kind of great when there's four, but then there's 16 and then there's like 16 squared and suddenly there's millions of brooms and there's some kind of cataclysm happening. And, it would be great if we could remember that we are not just Mickey Mouse, that we don't have to actually submit to this algorithm. It's an algorithm, yeah? Um, we are also the sorcerer as well as the um, apprentice, right? And we've got the, we've got the controls, really. And um, the, uh, you know, if, if Karl Marx had had access to the phrase adaptive AI, and also to the concept of machine learning, he probably could have written the first volume of Capital on one fortune cookie. Um, it could have said, you know, capitalism is an adaptive AI that machine well, learns how to extract life from the biosphere without stopping. It's like um, with... okay. Go, please. No, I just wanted to mention uh, French historian, Fernand Brodel, who brought this point about capitalism as a supercomputer uh, adaptive and I love it, actually. I, I really 
super loved reading um, all of the, those volumes of the history of capitalism. Yes, yeah. just amazing. You know, the, 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 I, I read that book when I was very young and I loved the illustrations in it, you know, the incredible colored pictures and all. Um, and I, my second book actually was about the spice trade and it was mostly from reading that book, you know, and how yeah. um, when they colonized the spice islands, the Europeans, you know, they would sell them um, spices in Europe, um, when they got them, you know, at like a seven hundred percent markup, that's what that, that's what they that's what happened. They got they created the first ever colonies, right? And and, and this is also relevant, right? Like so, my friend Amitav Ghosh and I both agree that the real wrong bit of the capitalism, what's actually wrong about it, you know, that if you were going to choose one flavor per aspect that was the worst bit or the bit that's like structuring the other bits, it would be the colonialism aspect the imperialism sort of thing <clears throat> this is very much to do with um a kind of behavior that still happens in in actually met men young men 20 something men in the supermarket piling their trolleys with toilet paper and like every other philosopher in the world i try to think about what does this toilet paper mean you know <laughs> and in part of course is to do with That's let's the case, maintain yeah. the the boundary yeah well you know slavoy's at it you were all trying to figure out what's what a toilet is i don't know why we seem to have so much confusion you know about this basic thing but what do you say um you know it's blank bland pile of stuff you know it's it's primitive accumulation you know in a kind of Kind of repeated in the supermarket, twenty something boys. It's like yes, exactly. When they get nervous, they what they think they should do is is to accumulate a huge pile, because that's what their ancestors did in the colonies. You see, and so you know, what I wrote this opera two years ago, and um, one of the one of the things in it was um, this phrase that I thought could be a great phrase on Twitter or or Instagram or something, which was you know, welcome to America, the biggest pile of Europe ever. Um, listen, and I think it's connected to the uh, to toilet case. Uh, you have a brilliant uh, observation uh, about emotional uh, sort of, uh, how to say that, development or dynamics. Now, when we start with guilt and go to the shame and then to um horror and then love and then melancholia so considering uh current pan pan pandemic situation where we are because uh i mean if we follow this uh sort of uh neurotic you know tray uh, it shows really interesting um social process and also change so what what, what do you think where where we are with the fear of uh, vaccination with the you know this is why i love talking like this is that thank you for asking these questions you know i feel like so i'm at the, this moment in time i am probably the great god pan you said the word pandemic and it made me think of my name is the pan feeling pan is the greek word for everything yeah. mm -hmm. and panic is actually the feeling of everything yeah mm. and 2020 as in vision at least for me personally i don't know about you but not only was it 2020 in terms of wow we're really seeing accurately what it what the what's happening to the biosphere now everybody's suddenly seeing it but also because of the lockdown the shift in the temporality a little tiny bit just allows you suddenly to realize what I do happens on lots of different scales all at the same time. And I saw my past and I thought about my life and I saw all kinds of ways in which I, my actions affect things on very, all kinds of different scales. And I started to write this book. And the reason why was that I was having this feeling and, and, and that my first sense of what that feeling was, was, was it was the feeling of everything happening at the same time. 
Mm. Um, so the book is called Everything is Happening. And um, then I realized, actually, there's a good word for this. It's panic. Yeah. So panic. Um, panic is the main flavor, you know, right now. Um, now, the thing to remember about panic you know, is that actually, it, if, if it's everything, it, it contains all the emotions, right? It mm -hmm. also has not just fear and terror, it has love. And as, as you say, sadness, it has joy, as it has laughter, as you know, it has every single emotion, good or bad or stupid or whatever. And that's what's interesting about it, right? Every feeling happening at the same time, and what to do about that. So I'm actually very keen possibly because I am also Lucifer, um, as well as Pan, on giving people permission to feel the maximum amount of panic. Anybody who tries to avoid this panic right now, um, politically, it's called fascism. You know, everybody in the fascist world is trying to create walls of various different kinds so that they don't have to go through this panic. But really, you know, it's fine. Um, I watched my friend Laurie Anderson taking a small group of 20 something people in Houston at this festival through Yoko Ono's scream piece. And I don't know if you know this piece, but it's like basically Yoko Ono says scream for 30 seconds at the top of your lungs. And these people were so happy that Laurie, who's a responsible adult, 70 year old person, had given these people permission to feel the feeling that they were actually feeling, which is the panic, you see. And I talk a lot to so-called Generation Z, you know, um, and this is a feeling they're having and they're being told not to. And we hear on the radio, oh, you shouldn't be feeling too bad about it. And I'm like, no, this is a really good time to feel incredibly bad about it. And then how to discover inside the bad something interesting. You know, so that you don't get frozen, right? Because actually, panic is interesting because it's it's in it's it's movement. You know, I was just thinking yesterday um, about um, right of spring, right? Stravinsky. I had not thought about that for ages, but but at the um, end of the first part of right of spring, there is the dance of the earth, and it is a dance of intense panic. You know, and there's amazing. kind of rhythms going on this one are the starting conditions for this emotional journey that you're describing that i'm outlining in this book called dark ecology because in a way um the emotional journey is all of it is inside this space called panic right so it is it's like okay good now most human beings on earth whether they want to or not are now paying attention they're looking at the blackboard as it were in the classroom um, and they're seeing what's really happening, right? And so that's good because, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're not seeing it, you, it's called being a psychopath at this point, you know? And if you, so, so you see it, then you try to avoid it. So that, and that's the fascism, right? But, you know, um, in the end, even if you try to avoid it, you've already admitted that you can't avoid it. So, you know, this is how the future in the end wins i feel i'm a spokesperson for the future um the thing about emotions in general i think you'd probably agree if if you were a bit mad like me is that they come from the future um obviously there's symptoms of things that happened in the past but phenomenologically again to use that word um they're from the future you know like so why do you go to therapy if you go to therapy why do you talk to your friend about some strange feeling you're having it's because you don't understand it yet, right? An emotion has this not yet quality to it. What is the not yet? It's a not yet from the future. You don't know what it is yet. That's why you're paying the therapist to figure it out, right? Um, and um, ideas on the other hand are the past. Yeah, ideas are processes that you've already gone through and you've created a label and then, you know, that's the past. Looking for the meaning of life in the past is called the fascism politically. Um, and um, it's and the monstrous sort of violent thing about it is you can't find meaning in the past because meaning is the future. Um, when I teach this to my undergrad students, I always say something like, you never know 
how this sentence will end, squirrel, dark, black hole, parenthesis, period, dot, 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 exclamation mark. You don't know in advance, right? The meaning is kind of there, but it's not there. So it's kind of flickering, right? And it's, it's this sentence, it's, it's not that sentence. It's a specific, but weirdly elusive, right? And so I'm, 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 I'm gonna speak up for this sort of shimmery, weirdly elusive, it's almost you can't see it thing called the future because the future is just as real as the past. It's just, it's just almost invisible. It's like a mirage or something like that. You know, it's not that it's completely invisible. You can detect it in the way everything is kind of slipping and moving. And so panic is also great because panic is literally saying, guess what? The future is approaching. It's actually sort of oh. in now, yeah? Um, it's like that moment when the Millennium Falcon zooms into the hyperspace, right? The Reagan administration tried to make that be their own thing. But really that's because I think that really George Lucas is a kind of very popular kind of Eisenstein guy who thinks in images and is very progressive, you know? Um, and this Millennium Falcon, Did I, did, did I mute myself just now? Uh, it's okay now, but there, there was a little break. I'm so sorry. I, I did not no, it's, it's, it's okay. mute myself, but I can say that again. And, it, and anyway, I was just talking some kind of oh. rubbish about the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, we, we face these, uh, actually, um, this pandemic and uh, this virus, should we consider these uh, as hyper objects? Uh, we so should. In, in fact, that's a very good question because, um, you know, now and now, now in this year, I would not write this book, Hyper Objects. I've uh -huh, given well. up trying to sound clever oh, really? and, and have clever yeah. ideas. You know, I think philosophy is a word that contains two emotions. It's not really about having ideas. It's about the movement. You know, and if you concentrate too hard on the ideas, it's a little bit like you're driving and you're looking too hard at the lamppost. And then you mm. hit the lamppost and you can't drive. And, you know, philosophy is love and wisdom is an, also a feeling, right? So, so, Sophia is an emotion, really. I mean, if you had a choice, right? Like wisdom is a series of ideas or instructions on a, on a fortune cookie or wisdom is a feeling, I think you would probably have to say that wisdom is a feeling. So philosophy isn't really about having ideas, you know, and like also, you know, trying to shock people is so 2013, you know, I'm, it's like that, that's not cool anymore, shocking people, because everyone's got the right feeling, it's called panic, and everyone's got the hyper object feeling, and I just was saying feelings are from the future and ideas are from the past, and, you know, it's called coronavirus. Everyone knows intuitively now what, what a hyper object is. So you don't need the word. I mean, it's great to have the word, mm. right? It's lovely to have a word like Rumpelstiltskin. You know, you say the name of Rumpelstiltskin and then he has to go to, to hell because you know his name. It's a way of abjuring a demonic force, right? So it's good to know the name and it's good to have a word that's just one word. Plus also, it's also is good to have a word that makes you feel smart. And when I came up with that word, I felt like, wow, that's, I must be really clever because I, that word, I, what does that even mean? It's Greek, it's Latin, it looks like the word television, it's really long, it's got this 16 by 9 letterbox format. That must be a great idea. What the fuck is it? You know, so, so, that, so the feeling happened to me first and I like that feeling. And, but now everyone can have this feeling and it's called coronavirus because coronavirus is a hyper object. It's everywhere, it's nowhere. It is very scary on an individual scale. On a big scale, it's like, you know, in Avatar, the film, Awa has heard you, you know, because all of a sudden, everywhere around the world, we've got planet scale awareness along with, and then Black Lives Matter happened, right? Like just before coronavirus was me too, which is also planet scale. Then there's coronavirus, which is planet scale. I mean, I'm saying planet scale, like, like Carla Lonzi, the Italian philosopher says the women's movement is planetary, it's not just international. And then Black Lives Matter is planet scale. And we've got transnational religions and we've got transnational corporations, but now we've got planet scale, collective awareness and action. So to that extent, 
I, I don't say thank God, I say thank virus. Um, do you think that uh, in this hyper object, hyper object as current virus connected? I mean, I'm asking because for you, uh, uh, hyper object is historically you know, long, huge. So it's not like in space, it's also in time. So does it connect it to uh, this uh, rich, bad history of plug and all these uh, disasters wow. has been happening? Uh, yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah. So actually, if you think about it, the, the first hyper objects that human beings were aware of were plague. Yeah. Like, yeah, in Greek, the word is miasma, um, and it means something in between um, some kind of disease or epidemic or pandemic, but also some feeling of, of guilt and shame and um, translated sometimes as blood guilt. And it's like all of the mukaus are dying. Oh, my God. Right. And so it must be our fault. I'm Oedipus and I'm going to figure it out. So we, we created this thing called civilization and we started farming cows and sheep and other cattle called slaves and women. And now the, the cows are all sick and I'm going to take responsibility for that, but I'm not really going to fix the real problem, which is the, that we separated ourselves from the biosphere. Um, and we isolated these cows and we made them eat this food. And now they've got this disease because we've done something to them. When I'm not going to do that, what I'm going to do instead is make it be my fault in another way. I'm going to investigate who's, who did this crime? Who did, who did this crime so that all the cows are dying? Oh, my God, it's me. I murdered my dad and I married my mum, and that must be the reason why. Oh, fuck. Now I have to stab myself in the eye with a, with a pair of needles. You know, and so this is the first ever hyper object, right? And the Oedipus tragedy... And tra many tragedies actually are about how human beings deal and don't deal with the first ever human created hyper object, right? That they were aware of. It's everywhere, it's nowhere, it's all around the city. It's people are dying of it. The cows are like taste horrible and they're falling apart. But you know, it's not just us because bacteria made their very own hyper object It's called oxygen. You know, three billion years ago, lots and lots of bacterial poop called oxygen killed a lot of bacteria and there's probably some kind of bacterial Sophocles who's written some kind of bacterial Oedipus play about a bacterium who's trying to solve the problem of how come we all keep dying so oh I know <laughs> I cloned myself in the wrong way um but you know this is this is um a, a thing to think about actually in your question is the note is the nature of, of, of an event right we've all been conned by Wikipedia but also by the reason why Wikipedia does this. We've been conned this, with this idea that time is a line and an event is a dot on a line, but really it's better to think of an event as a kind of explosion or as a ripple in a pond, right? And, you know, the, the, the effects of those plagues of the Middle Ages, for example, are still happening. Um, and the effects of the bacterial hyperobject is still happening. It's called oxygen. It's why we're do, doing this conversation because we can breathe. And so really, it's not a dot on a line three billion years ago. It's an ongoing explosion. Let's think about the biggest ever event. It's called the Big Bang. Right now, everything in, in that you can see is just the wavefront of the, of the Big Bang, right? It's, this is just the current state of the Big Bang, right? My nose, this coffee cup, the, the Zoom, everything around you is basically just how the wavefront looks right now, yeah? Because it's still happening, yeah? It's called the universe. And this is the point. Um, movement is intrinsic to things. And it's in fact, it's so intrinsic to things that things don't even need to be mechanically pushed to be moving. In fact, it's the other way around. It's more like mechanical motion is a semi-illusory after effect of something much more beautiful than that, which is that everything's vibrating all by itself. You know, so this rippling quality actually goes way way deeply into the structure of the universe so yeah you're, you're very right to to want to talk about you know previous plagues and how they kind of join together with this one 
in a funny way to make a kind of super, super hyper extra duper object. Well, listen, um, I'm asking this question because I have another one, which is kind of my problem with your argument. When we deal with hyper objects like, uh, you know, plague or this uh, virus, you know, we, we, we try to struggle. We try to sort of survive or at least, as you say, exist. <laughs> but uh, you say, I mean, ecological thinking starts with a very simple position, care less. So in it, it looks passive. It looks like, okay, let's Blake kill like another million. Well, mm. let's, let's virus yeah. destroy yeah, it does, civilization. doesn't it? Yeah. So, no, I, I have, yeah. That, that, that's my sort of, you know, yeah, it does um, look like that. point uh, about your argument. So yeah. could, you, could you help me with that? Could, because... I could help you with that. <laughs> yeah, it, it only looks evil from the point of view of a, a certain addiction to efficiency. Because actually, in the end, efficiency is the evil. If, if you've ever seen Twin Peaks, that, that David Lynch thing is all about how Agent Cooper is a lovely, beautiful person. But his efficiency is what actually creates the problem that he's trying to solve. And capitalism is the most efficient version yet of the solution to the problem of human beings mm -hmm. not realizing that they're part of the biosphere. Um, and acting on that, you know, it's called science and you know, it's wrong to think of the Paleolithic as this prehistorical stone age with people who didn't know anything in it, because actually it's called being scientist. You know, they, they did different science and they found out different things. But, you know, the, my followers, the witches, you know, they got burned later by religion. Um, nowadays, we're being asked to trust science again. But really what we're being asked to do is realize that we're part of the biosphere and that we're actually cannot es escape from that. And that the attempt to escape from it makes it much, much worse. Whatever we thought was bad that was going on in our lives. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I do think this notion of like realizing that you're part of something is probably too easy. I think that philosophers like me and politicians also try to make it sound much too difficult. Politicians so they don't want to do it, and philosophers because they want to look really smart, and I'm so smart that you, you wouldn't even understand how difficult this is going to be. Um, and or they suggest some kind of violence, you know, to do to do it. So I'm on the side of the easy solution, this non-violent approach, right, which is just realizing that you are an evolution product. You've got little crustaceans running around in your eyes. You, it's too easy to realize that the, the, the hard thing is to think I am a separate, different being who's different and separate and special, especially because I'm white and because I'm a guy. You know, that's the really hard thing to think because it's not true. And so it's not the same quite. Th it's not really the same thing as saying we shouldn't do anything. It's more the saying we should be doing everything right now, even if those things don't join up perfectly, even if we don't know what to do first, we shouldn't be even be having a debate about which do we do first, because that's all about trying to be efficient. We should just be trying everything right now, and we should be doing things on an individual scale, neighborhood, town, country, you know, we should be trying everything. Um, and um, so, so I, I'm, I'm actually not saying don't do anything. I'm saying do everything. But while you're doing everything, this funny thing occurs to you, which is that, you know, you didn't really have to try that hard to, to relax into realizing that you're an embodied being. The motivation for doing everything is actually super easy. And, you know, we, um, in, in, you know, socialism and talks about alienation. And what are we alienated from? We're actually alienated from knowing that we're part of the biosphere all this god stuff about this you know this sort of white guy with a beard who's trying to kill you mostly who lives beyond the sky is all just some kind of upside down displaced way of realizing that we're part of the world of gorillas and orangutans you know if you study those guys you find out that a lot of the sort of compassion and sharing and all that good stuff is actually coming from that you know so when when ludwig feuerbach says you know that 
that God is love, you flip it upside down, it means love is God, right? So the God is alienated human being, X-Men superpowers, right? And, you know, the, what are these X-Men superpowers? They're actually the powers of being an embodied being with a brain. Like, my brain is so much better than my mind. You know, my brain is so much bigger than my idea of who I am. And a lot of esoteric religion is actually all about just letting your brain exist. You know, like esoteric high level Buddhist meditation is really just saying reality is a crystal ball and everything in the ball, all this, all the phenomena are just reflections. It's really just saying that you've got a brain and there are these brain activities happening. And just once in a while, just remember that you're a brain and just be your brain for a while because it's super, super healthy and good. And all the good stuff is in there. Like I'm saying that inside the panic, which is which is everything, right? Which is the basically the panic is the is the key signature of the biosphere itself, right? Stravinsky got it right, and so you know, in within you is everything you need already, and you don't have to try for one more second. In fact, that's the ideology: is this idea of how can we do this? Oh my God! Oh no! Because that's called religion. Right. You know, you, when you're in church or whatever, and you use some kind of oppressive religion environment and everybody's trying to outperform everybody else. Like, oh, I'm holier than you are because I know how impossible it is to be a good person. And everyone's like, but didn't you actually listen to Jesus? Like when when the Buddhist teachers like actually enlightenment is really easy. You just have to slightly adjust your head and everybody goes, oh, but but but, but how can I do that? And they're all just trying to virtue signal how good they are. But if you think about it, that's actually the structure of that is called evil, right? How am I going to help the biosphere? Oh, no. How am I going to help all the other animals? You know, you're actually contributing to the problem, though, if you think it's this hard, big thing that you've got to really work for. It's really easy, you know, put these on and don't, you know, have a nice time with a, with a, with a cat and a dog and a, moo, and a moo cow and another human being. So, uh, um, panic and careless. Panic is sort of uncontrolled and not really meditative, contemplating thing. It's just active chaos, right? There you go. Pan panic and, is a beautiful thing. Panic is like where you want to be. When you meditate, everybody gets there eventually. And then they go, oh, fuck, I fucked it up. It's wrong. I'm, something's wrong. Oh, okay. Meditation is wrong or I'm wrong. Then they stop, you know, really seriously. Panic is like you, when you hit the panic, you've found the gold, you know, but you don't know that yet. You've, you've landed on the earth, literally. You've actually, you know, wouldn't that be great if Elon Musk was to try to land on earth one of these days, like with all the other billionaires? They should try that first before they go into space. Blue Origin wanted me to come and talk to them next week. And I was going to say that they they um, they withdrew their offer when they realized they were going to have to actually pay me, um, you know, because I don't do stuff for free, not for Blue Origin anyway. Um, and I was going to say, you know, because you want the opportunity to say something like the sex pistols, you know, you want to go in there and say something like, have you ever tried landing on Earth? That would be nice, you know. So, I mean, I, I like your style of bringing together uh, sort of controversial moments like panic and KLS. I mean, panic is sort of and KLS is like <laughs> in a way, though. Interestingly, they're the same, it is, it right? Is. Like, yeah, like yeah, when yeah. you meditate, you're being carefree, careless. You're just letting yourself blur. And when you let yourself blur, what comes up is the panic. Actually, okay. the careless yeah. and the panic mm -hmm. are almost part of the same thing, right? Like, I mean, if you drive carelessly, you will soon be panicking because you will soon realize okay. that there are other cars that are trying to kill you, you know, at, by accident or on purpose. And so, yeah, careless brings up the panic. It's why we try to avoid the careless, you know, because we don't want to panic, but we should be panicking right now. So in a way, you know, it's just like, I think people like me who believe that there's a problem, my, my, you know, we've hoovered up all those people who believe, like the religious eco people, we've got all, all those people are on side now. So stop talking like that, you know, and, and talk to ordinary people who don't give a shit because they're the people who need to give a shit. So how do you make someone who doesn't give a shit give a shit? You actually have to respect the not giving a shit quality. You, got, you can't like, 
like you know when someone's father or, or mother has just died and they're just sitting there looking really blank the thing that you don't do is you don't go up to them and go damn it you idiot don't you realize that your dad just died because that's going to make them not even want to talk to you ever again what you got to do is be with the numb feeling you know and inside the numb is going to be the sadness and the pain and the grief you know you don't want to delete the numb you know um also maybe again it's like being a teacher is is, is interesting because at first you're trying to be be one really hard which is why you're not so good at teaching and then you realize oh i don't have to be a teacher because i am a teacher what does it mean it means like so there's people watching me right now who know that i'm thinking for them and, and helping them and talking so i don't have to be that because i am that do you see what i'm saying it's like you know you you, you don't have to be someone's boyfriend because you are someone's boyfriend just just let it happen okay and then um I see, I see better uh, how your logic goes to the ecological society. I like, I like the piece you wrote about future ecologic society should be uh, a little broken, relaxed, strange, ironical, stupid, sad, unstable world of love of pillows. My favorite salad. Oh, uh, yeah. And also this world of disgust and uh, uh, and not authority, more or less yeah. truth. So my question uh, is about. I mean, I, I, I like I like this uh, picture, but mm. then, then you say something like, "If you want to change uh, current problems, current situation." There should be collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. There should be collective uh, subject, and probably this collective subject, of course, uh, should include uh, unhumans, right? Mm -hmm. So this society, ec ecologically concerned society, uh, yeah, but it doesn't look collectively responsible the way you describe it uh relaxed broken strange ironical stupid how, how how do you how do you see this uh social connections uh of uh people who mm -hmm. who, who follow this uh ecological path okay let's just cut to the chase i am a communist and i do think that the reason why previous revolutions have failed is that they were not sufficiently tied to the biosphere and the way they conceptualized everything about them right you've got people saying now it's the revolution now 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 because i'm the guy with the conch and i'm mm -hmm. going to be in charge and there's a big difference between acting and like little incremental changes and we've basically just retweeting some kind of stupid neoplatonic christian stuff from the middle ages it isn't really about communism it's really about some kind of machismo you know some kind of masculine versus feminine you know some kind of you know trump versus obama you know the, somebody who really does things versus this passive feminine guy who actually got a lot of stuff done by getting all that asbestos removed from the housing project you know well, whereas the extremely left-wing identified guy who was part of the panthers was, didn't get anything done in his little community organizing group and so maybe we've been conned you know maybe we've been conned into thinking that what we're being is very left-wing when actually what we're doing is retweeting christian like neoplatonic stuff i mean it's not even like called jewish mysticism it's this crappy platonic shit from the middle ages it didn't ever work you know they basically thought that god was omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and now we've got the same thing it's called google because we've automated it we've got facebook and google and you know all those guys are trying to be omniscient but you can't you can't be omniscient you can't be omnipresent that's not possible in this world um and this is where i'm also a deconstructor of course in the lineage of, of jacques derrida and martin heidegger um and object-oriented ontology right which is saying the same thing now the future as you describe it is going to feel like that especially to us because it's going to be uh, creative 
if you wanted to like put all those words together and like put, change it to one word, it would be creativity. Yeah, um, the, a, a socialist world by definition is a creative world where you get to create your own life, like how, how, you, like, how you like it a lot better. Um, Oscar Wilde, my favorite writer on socialism, he's got an essay called The Soul of Man Under Socialism. And he's basically saying it's more individualism than now because you don't have to like work all the time to, for some other guy. Um, you can sculpt your life, right? So, you know, we, we've got a problem, which is that we haven't really figured out like what genuine like um, collectivity would could be and i think it's in part because we place too much emphasis on choices and actions and a certain theory of act that has to do with this kind of action versus passive the word solidarity is a feeling it's not just a it's not just a sort of a a state that you achieve it's a feeling that you notice right so for example right now we're talking and i have the slightly uneasy feeling what's what next genius question is this guy going to ask me that's going to freak me out and make it very hard for me to answer. Oh dear, slightly uneasy. And this is the basis of the solidarity, actually. Like, so imagine a single celled organism and they're floating through the ocean. And all of a sudden, and it's three billion years ago, and all of a sudden, boom, and the organism goes, fuck, did I just swallow poison? You know, like you get involved with somebody and you're going, is this gonna be the toxic relationship that finally makes it impossible for me to ever have anybody in my life ever again because they're gonna destroy me? Yeah, if you try to find out in advance, it's over, right? If you interview the person, you, you, you've, you've just blown it, yeah? If the bacteria has a really hard cell wall, it's never gonna let that thing in, it can't even eat, so it's gonna die. So the possibility of being poisoned, right? Which is, is or, or the paranoia, is actually the, the paranoia is the basis of empathy and the possibility of being poisoned is the basis of symbiosis. And symbiosis is the driver of evolution. And a hundred, whatever, million years later, the descendants of that single-celled organism are going, that was not poison. That was an anaerobic bacteria that was hiding from the bacteria hyperobject. And now we're called animals because we've got these mitochondria inside us that can produce energy or we're called plants because we've got these chloroplasts inside us that can photosynthesize. And that was so groovy that, thank you ancestor for accidentally swallowing that thing. You must've been really worried that it was poison and you couldn't know in advance, right? And so fundamentally all these things about the future, which you're describing and creativity are about the possibility of f fucking up, you know? And, and this is what revolutionary projects don't build into them enough. This sort of uneasy, maybe we're gonna fuck it up quality and a certain sense of silliness, which is vital to being an artist, right? Yeah. If you're an artist, you are super committed to failure and being silly. Um, and, and I think those are very important political things. You know, why can't politicians be silly in public? Why do they have to keep doubling down on the serious, you know? Why does even the si silly stuff get weaponized? You know, Google weaponizes it in the form of a kind of serious playfulness where you have to act like a kid AKA a stupid person, not a real kid. You know, when you're in that, when you're in the Google building, they've got all these like food dispensers and the, the cafeteria there looks like a, you know, kids playground, you know, I, they'll, they'll, they'll never invite me back now because I've just violated the non-disclosure agreement. But quite frankly, I don't want to be because I've told them what to do and they haven't done it. Oh yeah, I, actually I didn't expect that kind of, uh brilliant sense of humor on your side so th thanks thanks a lot but you are so welcome <laughs> so and now the real me uh, i'm trying to go real serious but i mean yeah <laughs> okay one of us has to to make this uh, sound well, th thank th thank you I, I mean your artistism is is amazing so um uh, in this ecological future, or probably part of it is happening now, we are not anthropocentric world. We integrated and sort of making society of biosphere. My cat or my whatever table mm -hmm. is a sort of like Laturian, you know, network of things, parliament of things, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
my question Wish I could is, understand it. Should we should we invite coronavirus in this uh, idealistic biospheric society? Now, well, my answer is, first of all, we already did. So we don't have okay. to do any inviting here. We just have to notice that the biosphere is already here. It's in, your, it's in your arms, it's in your legs, it's in your brain, it's you've already invited it in. This whole idea that we were living in human social space separated off is the illusion, yeah? There's another way of answering your question though, which I think is very important. Fuck this virus, right? Like, like some people like me say things like the AIDS virus has just as much of a right to exist as an AIDS patient. Fuck that shit. The AIDS patient I care about, the AIDS virus I would like to not exist. So the, thing, the interesting thing about everything being sort of equally existing or equally important is the opposite of everything has the equal right to exist. It's actually now you're free to make a real That's choice. That's what my Do question I want this is about. guy to yeah. die? Do I want this guy to die? I would rather the AIDS virus would die than a human being. Um, so, so, you know, so, so kill me. So sue me. You know, I, I have this prejudice for these people. I want these people. I care about this, right? And now you realize that your decision is very, like, existential. There's no un nothing underneath. There's no ontological reason why, you know. And so this is actually a good thing because now you're free to make a real decision in your life. Like, who would I like to live and who would I like to die? And who, what do I really care about? You see, that's, that's the real heart of this issue is that now we're realizing we're free to make very strong political decisions on the basis of absolutely nothing at all. Yeah, that's what my question is about. How do we... Uh... Well, how do we well, pr proceed in the uh, the real the, 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 the correct metric is pleasure, okay, but it's not utilitarian pleasure because utilitarian pleasure is teleological, right? Teleology is a big bad enemy of me. Um, more than almost any other philosophical idea, the idea that things have a point to them, that they're going in a certain direction, that there's a Ford's gear, that there's a thing called progress. All these things are the most toxic things of all. You know, like just take the idea of Aristotle, right? Which is that, you know, people like him and his student, Alexander the Great, their destiny is to enslave barbarians and all the other people who are called barbarians, their destiny is to be the slaves of Alexander the Great. This is obviously, you know, hardwired into capitalist social space, right? And so I think this idea of teleology, progress, you know, make growth, you know, all these ideas are based on something incorrect about the universe, funnily enough, which is that it's got a Ford's gear. Life is saying something true about the structure of reality, which is that life is slightly resisting the entropy. This Boltzmann guy who said there's an arrow of time and it's always going this way, wrong, because look, he's a life form. Slightly, he's resisting that just for a minute. Why? Because actually, life is saying something true about quantum theory, right? That's what life is. Life is a thing that is saying, wow, quantum theory is correct. That's what life is. And what is life really? It's not a concept of life versus not alive. It is not also a legal concept of you have a right to live and you don't. Life actually is this vibrating, shimmering. That's what it is. The Greek word is not bios, which is the biology concept, and it is not zoe, which is the legal juridical concept. It is thumos. And this is the word at the end of the word rhythm. The THM at the end of the word is this, and it means if you know this word, you point here, because what it means is the palpitating, right? From maybe a very generalized perspective, it's going dun 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 dun. But when you get really close with a echo cardiogram is going that's why you can have a heart attack because it's already doing that right and so this palpitating trembling quality isn't just about alive right it's not about this is alive this is not alive it's about how things are vibrating all by themselves the default art is dance it's you're moving your body right when you read a poem you're moving this part of your body the default dance is called being alive right? You get up, you get out of bed, you brush your teeth. It's a bit boring, but it is dancing. 
Um, the default alive is called being asleep, right? You're lying in bed, your body's just going vum, 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 all by itself. Your brain is dreaming you know, vum, 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 all by itself. This is the life in the phrase Black Lives Matter, right? This is the life that you stand up for when you do the nonviolent direct action, right? Uh, nonviolent resistance, right? You, you, you become a quote unquote dead weight, but really it should be called living weight in a way. The, the police officer finds it very hard to lift you off the street because you're blah, right? This is the life, right? This is what it, we're trying to protect and defend is the, just the simple, could I just be alive without someone trying to kill me? Yeah. And so it, this is the basis for re-theorizing pleasure. It does not have a direction, right? It's not about getting better. It's not about existing versus not existing. It's about allowing this shimmery quality to manifest as much as possible, right? And I think what is wrong with our world right now is not that there's too much pleasure, you know? It's that there's much too little pleasure, right? I want dolphin pleasure, coral pleasure, pine tree pleasure. Once I find out what happens when I eat the animal to the animal, then I don't have any pleasure for, from it. And, you know, so I, when I inhibit my behavior, I'm not restraining some basic impulse to murder and rape people. That's a stupid right-wing reactionary idea. When I'm inhibiting my behavior, what I'm really doing is I'm increasing my pleasure. There's something very true about this Frankie Goes to Hollywood, s and gay disco thing. You know what? I was reading one of your books and uh, somewhere in the middle, I was thinking like, will this guy end up with Epicurean argument? Yeah, and, and right, right now, <laughs> right now you did. See, I've got the right, I've got the right costume on, <laughs> or is it a costume? Great, yes. So, uh, <laughs> Professor Morton, uh, another serious question uh, is about technology. So, uh, your argument, uh, in your arguments in your books, and the dark ecology, and um, uh, other books. Uh, we sort of uh, slide away from technological agenda. And mm -hmm. I, I myself, I work in art theory and technological art, uh, mm. history and theory. So I should ask you uh, this question because in traditional sense, uh, uh, I mean, these days, uh, ecological agenda is considered uh, strongly connected to uh, technology. So technology, whatever, transportation, energy production causes uh, bad effects on uh, nature. And then what we can do, uh, we can uh, solve technological problem with another technology. That's, that's the, the only thing uh, uh, we, we, we can manage uh, this problem. Uh, so say electric cars instead of you know uh, uh, gas gasoline cars. Yeah. So so how how do you uh, how do you see uh, this question of technology in your dark ecological yeah. approach? I'm surprised that you think that I don't like technology but i'm also a bit confused because i don't even understand what it is right <laughs> okay. so i mean uh, so for an ant a leaf is technology right for a tree a leaf is technology for a leaf a tree is technology technology is just like how one entity is exploiting or using or adapting to another one really um, and the, the, the main problem with fetishizing technology is not to do with silicon chips and like screens and all that stuff. It's to do with assuming that the world is fundamentally instrumental, that it's fundamentally yeah, consists yeah, of yeah. tools, right. because actually in this world, we do not have a world which is only the tools. We have a world which is actually um, a world of, of, of beings. Where am I here on the screen here? I've just lost myself. And I've lost you too, for some reason. I can't see you. I, I, um, I see you. Oh, there. Everything is fine. There you are. Good, uh -huh. good, good, good. Um, we have a world that is not reducible to tools. 
Yeah, not completely. Okay. That's the point, right? So, you know, you sow a slave by Aristotle, my enemy, is called organon emsukon, a, a tool with a soul. Whereas it is, in fact, quite obvious that what a slave is, is a soul that has been reduced to a tool. That's why it's evil to have slavery. And, you know, um, this is the point of the object-oriented ontology, right? It's saying, you know, you every time you treat something as a tool, you're basically ignoring it, it, which is a kind of violence. You know, every time, like when you pick up your toothbrush and you brush your teeth, there's something you're doing there is, is not completely everything that that toothbrush is, yeah? Because 500 years later, that toothbrush is going to be something else to some, somebody else, right? And then maybe today the fly lands on the toothbrush. So you're actually really the toothbrush is now a landing strip. It's not a toothbrush. The fly is using it in, a, in another way. It's another kind of technology, right? My hand is tech for holding the phone. The phone is tech for talking to you. The air is tech for, um, for the breathing, right? So this whole idea that the tech is, is the basis of stuff and furthermore, even worse, there's a certain kind of thing called tech and then there's everything else called nature or whatever. You know, that's just, a, that's just I'm sorry to say, stupid. Well, I'm just, uh, you know, trying to figure uh, if you follow your argument, ecological thinking uh, sort of avoids technological, uh, at least current technological uh, hope on, say, biotechnology helping oh, us. Oh, sure. There's a huge amount of ideology about, you know, tech will uh -huh. save us. But that's because, you know, yeah. tech will save us in the context of just ignoring the world in which a certain kind of technology is being, you know, fetishized. Right. Tech will save us basically means, you know, we're going to carry on with the sorcerer's apprentice broom world. That's fine. We're not going to change the fundamental way we relate to each other. We're just going to tweak the tools that we use, you know, and it's just that that's obviously not going to work because the tools were the problem. And that this is not an argument of primitivism. This is not saying, you know, that, that, that motor cars are a bad idea. They're an extremely good idea. I would be executed in any previous iteration of civilization for all the ideas in my head and the makeup on my face and the horns that I've got growing out of my skull, I would be executed. So I'm placing my bet. The future is going to be much nicer than the past. You know, so, I, so this idea that, you know, if people like me are opposed to technology is very sort of not cool in another way, because, you know, um, wouldn't it be great if, if, if we created a future in which pe people like me could not be killed a lot um, and other sorts of people too? So, you know, that, I think to me that's the main point, right? And it's not about like technology is bad. It's just more like, you know, while we're obviously going to need to create wonderful things that use the power of the sun and the power of wind and so forth and so forth, doing that cannot be isolated from the other thing that you have to do item one okay. end white supremacy item two end patriarchy item three stop or seriously modify capitalism what about that machine you know why don't we fix that one or get rid of that one like really quickly you know because that's the one that's actually munching the biosphere yeah so you you are not going uh, you wouldn't become a, a ludist uh, leader and uh... oh definitely not okay. yeah no there's a, okay. there's nothing intrinsically wrong with okay. with you know there's nothing intrinsically wrong with trying to get from a to b you know it's when you turn it into a whole way of life you know it starts to go a little bit wrong you know when then then it becomes a kind of psychopath thing if all you're trying to do is get from a to b you're really basically, you know, that's really sort of what evil is. You know, it's, it's ev ev evil is efficiency. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, the more efficient you are, the more life forms you're going to kill. Okay. And um, well, I'm, as you see, I'm trying not to ask you like, hardcore professional questions related to different philosophies. These are super hardcore questions. Uh, These are the questions, dude. There's no <laughs> other questions. Well, but uh, what, what I mean, uh, I'm, I'm super curious how you 
working with Heideggerian argument, uh, mm -hmm. how do you see his fundamental ontological uh, point on te techno and technology? Because uh, yeah, well, uh, I just said it. You know, basically, what a what a tool is is a is a way of um, creating a world. Right, like there's this American saying, you know, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? To a nuclear bomb, everything looks like something you can drop a nuclear bomb on, right? That's mm -hmm. the thing. To the capitalism, everything looks like something you can make money out of, right? That's the point of a tool, right? It's, it's that, that's the real point. That's what Heidegger is saying there. Okay. You know, he's saying that basically tech is secondary, and when you treat it as primary, you just fucked yourself. Okay, so my final question, or maybe set of questions, depending on you, is about art, of course. Mm. Uh, so um, your argument, uh, your, I mean, very strong argument, and I really like it, uh, goes like art is the only thing that bring us uh, to openness of things. So beauty yeah is something that brings brings us back to the world so and also helps us to rethink who who we are but could you please tell tell us more about art as an uh, ecological yeah uh, ecological part of ecological thought yeah or activism or yeah. Uh, yeah, I have just realized that I am an extreme aestheticist. I, the, I'm from 1888. You know, I'm also from 1988. You know, I'm from, I'm from the techno age. And I'm, I'm from 1888. Age. I'm from the age of Oscar Wilde and Debussy and aestheticism and the fin de siècle of Paris with the Art Nouveau stuff. And, you know, what is evil in, as far as that world is concerned? Um, is the very idea that there is a thing called evil and a thing called good, right? That these things are different um, and that you must distinguish also between beauty and ugly. The Picture of Dorian Gray is a great book because it's all about how it's not the aestheticism that is the problem. It's the trying to distinguish between beautiful and ugly that is part of the evil. And, you know, it's a problem for me in my life that I mean I love all of those guys don't get me wrong I loved studying the Opoyaz movement of the early Russian revolution and what Trotsky ended up calling Russian formalism you know was an amazing thing but they had all kinds of thoughts about art for art's sake and symbolism and stuff and they didn't need to have them and it kind of ruined my early undergraduate education because all the theory classes begin not with 1880s but with 1920s and I think they should start a little bit earlier and that, that artists should get a little bit more like militant about their aestheticism, actually, because it's really that we figured out how to proceed ecologically in the 1850s, 1860s. It's called ennui. It was invented by Charles Baudelaire. We've got the right chemical. The ennui chemical is a kind of oscillation between enjoyment and disgust. It's like, oh, I'm really bored out of my skull, but it's kind of weirdly enjoyable. Ugh. I'm covered in vampires, but actually that's not a bad thing, but it kind of is, but it kind of isn't. But it's kind of weird that I like it, but it's kind of freaky that I think that it's weird that I like it. And it's kind of great that I think that it's weird, that it's freaky, that I, oh, 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 oh. yeah. It's called being a scientist. Right, like, like you're holding a rock in your hand and you're doing a geology PhD and you're going, oh my God, what the fuck? I, this is a billion years now and I'm responsible for this because I'm a geology PhD and I have to explain this to people now. Or you're a physicist and you're looking at a black hole. It's, Jesus, that's a horrible thing. Oh my God, but I'm super fascinated by it. Or you're a biologist and you're on the radio in Houston, Texas, where I live, and it's last year and you're going, this sea lion mother was loving on me in the ocean. I was crying because it was so beautiful that she loved me. But how she was doing it was disgusting because she was throwing me these dead penguins, right? Beauty and disgust. Disgust is the beauty that you can't quite, as a human being, appropriate it yet. You can't quite wrap your lips around it just yet. It's the poison. 
all the beauty has a little bit of the poison in it to be delicious the rice pudding has to have a little bit of the burned you know and the toast has to be a little bit burned and the thing that thinks that seems to be evil is actually just some other life form's way of enjoying right so the mona lisa like the some snail is crawling up the Mona Lisa and you go, oh, you know, God, there's a snail on the Mona Lisa. That's disgusting. But really the snail is enjoying the Mona Lisa in the snail way. And so ecological art, therefore, and art in an ecological age, moreover, must and does contain a disgust element to it. And it's not that everything is disgusting or that everything is actually delicious. Shit and chocolate mousse look the same, but they're actually different. Disgust and beauty are different. It's just that they also overlap. This is also science because beauty is really the feeling of true. You know, like when you go, oh my God, that's true. You know, you are my true love. That's the beauty feeling, right? Beauty is the feeling of getting an equation right. It's, oh my God, I, E does equal MC squared. Fuck, the wall went transparent right? M math is you're on the wall, right? You're communing with something. That's what the Greek word math really means. Mathesis, it means communing with something. Sometimes when you're communing with something, it's very opaque, like one plus one is what? This five-year-old child is worrying. Some 40-year-old mathematician is going, fear math's last theorem. What the fuck? I can't do it. X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared. I can't prove it. Ah! then sometimes the wall becomes transparent and it's beautiful. And it's just like, wow, I see it, right? But you could be wrong. You know, if you're Einstein, that E equals MC squared could be wrong 200 years from now. So there's an element of feeling of false inside the true overlapping. It's true. But it's not medieval true. Medieval true is if you don't agree with me, I'm going to torture you until you do agree with me. Science true is actually the feeling of it is called the beauty. And the actual beauty also has this disgust, death, sliver inside of it, like a little homeopathic dose. It always makes it more delicious to have a little bit of what you think is the evil inside the art. So I'm very committed to a certain kind of art that maximizes this. And the aestheticism is all about that, right? It's like, let's try to incorporate disgusting things into our art, you know, not because they are really beautiful, but because they're not actually, you know, like we've learned a little bit from J Japanese aesthetics and we're going to put like some kind of roughened, unfinished broken stuff into our art i think all that stuff is amazing and i think basically art figured it out in the late 19th century how to live in an ecological age and um so you know i i i, I went i i'm wearing this all the time now and i taught this class two days ago and i suddenly realized i'm teaching about debussy syrinx the the, the pan you know and who who plays the flute Right, and I'm talking about this in class. I'm suddenly, oh, I've got the right, I've got the right costume. In the previous class, I'm talking about Nietzsche, the birth of tragedy is also about Pan. And so now I'm thinking, I'm going to go all my lectures like this. This is the first one. That's a great idea. I, I think I, I, I will be thinking about doing the same. <laughs> Please, we should, if we do all do this, this is now, and then we can create a thing called the IPCC, um, the, oh, but the, the real one intraplanetary concerned critters everyone uh, this is the uniform you have to wear oh okay and when you when you talk don't try to persuade people anymore about ecology what do you have to do instead you have to blow their mind <laughs> stop trying to be right start blowing people's mind now well that's that's the hardest thing to do Tim, timothy listen um talking about art uh we know that contempt in, inside the art world, we know that it is really integrated in capitalism, and it's part of the capitalism, speculative capitalism. So on one hand, you're saying that art helps us uh, with solidarity and solidarity with non-humans. But on another hand, art is a sort of best friend of capitalism okay can this and, be the uh, last question say it again can this be Pete? the last question Pete? 
Maybe Can this be the last question? Ah, no, no. So, this must. This has to be the end because I got to go somewhere. Uh, okay. So that, that, that's the question. How, how do you? Um, how do we live with the art as a? This is the. This is the. This is the thing. People like me always try to make everybody feel cynical and bad, you know. And the. But where else are you going to find the future? But in the past. Look around you. All everything you see is the past, right? Like somebody put that 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 board behind you, somewhere yesterday, two weeks ago, five years ago. Somebody put that that thing behind you. Somebody built the wall. My face is a map of everything that happened to my face, including the makeup I put on to do this thing. And so basically, all around you is the past. So you know you're not going to find the future anywhere else except in the past. Right? You're not going to find a, a, a progressive future world anywhere except for inside the thing that we're looking at right now, which has a capitalism flavor. So don't worry about it so much. <laughs> okay, makes sense. So do you do we have yes or not? Just one moment. Uh, we promised our audience to ask questions, to let us questions. Beautiful. Yeah. So just another five, seven minutes. Sure. Yes. Oh, there is no questions. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow. So and Jeez. and maybe my last question about art. What's your motivation to be active in art productions mm. and events and festivals? Uh, like philosopher and academic professional so art is higher up than philosopher or academic or professional you know being an artist means you're actually creating the future you're creating new facts right so academic is analyzing these facts or supporting the possibility of creating these facts but an artist is actually making the facts that's what you're doing when you're doing art you're literally changing reality you know it's easy to understand you take a canvas you put some paint on it you changed reality, right? You're making a new fact in the world. That's obviously the top level, right? So in the end, I want to do things on that level. And I'm starting to write like fiction and things because I think it quite might be good. And I, I think I can write good sentences. And I think that it's too, the world is moving too intense to just be trying to think about it and have ideas about it. That's a bit too like compression. You know, like when you take a sound and you make it seem very punchy, but you take a lot of information out of the sound, it's very lossy, you know, whereas if you're writing a poem or a story, it's like having an idea, but an incredibly slow motion, like a Bill Viola movie and everything's just moving like this, like you kind of even not even know where the idea is going to go or even if there is an idea, because look at the movement is so incredibly like slow-mo, yeah. And there's something about that that's really nice, I think, this kind of slow motion, first gear, reverse gear, winching gear. It's a kind of talk, talk you know, whereas speeding around, trying to have the right idea is, is you know, it's just for dummies. Okay, yeah, perfect. So, of course, I have more questions, but our time is getting over. And, can we do uh, this again it was very beautiful and i i'm deeply honored that you wanted me to be part of this and i'm very glad that we have recorded it because i think we did a pretty good job i hope so my pleasure and thanks for your artistic and uh, very in-depth presentation and answer it's my deepest pleasure I, i'm deeply deeply honored that when I did the thing at, at the garage in Moscow, that was the same level of intense, and beautiful and wow. And I just, please, Russian people have me back because I would like to, maybe I break a rule course, and actually course. come to Russia because I would, I have, I've, oh, I've never had a bad one with the an amazing my, minds, you know, over you there are, or over here. You are always welcome. And you probably know that your books and, uh, your talks are very popular among the intellectual oh, educated I'm people so here. happy about that yeah. that's that's beautiful thank you for saying now, that. it was a real pleasure to meet you and oh, it's a uh, pleasure to meet you too it's actually a good lesson for me uh, how to say 
artistic academic um, oh well <laughs> conversation mm. i don't i don't know what i'm doing you know but but maybe that's that's the point i just sort, of let, I just sort of let it happen you know and maybe i should my, my let myself mm. go too so <laughs> Very nice so, to meet you. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, cheers, cheers. May the force be with you.